A great time to be had for all at the 10th Annual Emerald Cup at the Sonoma County Fairgrounds in Sonoma County. Uh, it lasts for two days, but here are the highlights from the second and final day. We're going to have some uh, outtakes from certain interesting conversations and have beautiful images and the final judging uh, results for the over nearly 300 entries, uh, exemplary examples of fine horticultural effort. This first segment is uh, discussions in trends in breeding from Greenhouse Seeds, Simon the Professor, uh, the, Sasha the Joint Doctor, and moderated by John Brigados. For also, as well as the bigger companies, a healthy industry should have the, the smaller companies as well, the boutique industry. And I'd like to see more collaboration between those two. When we were filming uh, Australia Just Columbia with the vice group, um, we got a similar question to one of the interviews. What I replied to the question back then was that when the industry, when the really big players of the pharma industry and other industries get interested in cannabis, they will have the money and the know-how to definitely take over if they want to, if the legal framework allows them to. But they will always need that magical craftsmanship that connects the threads between cannabis culture, the land prices, the seed stock, the libraries, the elite clubs, the knowledge about how to really get the maximum out of certain strains in certain conditions without giving a scientific background to document how and why you do it, but you know that it just works. All this kind of Cannabis culture, so to speak, is what the big corporations lack. They know they like it, they know they need us, they know they cannot grab the cannabis industry and kick us out. They need to integrate us into it. And that's why we believe that by being at the cutting edge of research, by funding a lot of development with the money we make, with the, with the profits we make, by reinvesting a lot of our money into research and development, by staying on top of this, we will make Make sure that we keep ourselves in a very independent, in an indispensable position. They cannot get rid of us. They need us if they want to really get serious in the future and make this into a legal big worldwide industry. All these people came from, from a long, long way. Uh, and because they're basically one of us, one of your and they heard about the magic of it. I just want to thank them before we open it up. That they came from a really, really, really long way. They paid us back just to, just to meet you guys and see what this place is all about. So I just want to give them a warm hand for that. Same time, you know, everybody's talking about legalization, but we're talking about regulation. 
because I think it freaks out the politicians a little bit less. But then, if you see our movies, you go around the equator, it's 200 million people depending on the illegality of this product. So uh, these are people that are not being reached out by the United Nations or by whatever. They're really, really surviving on this crop, you know. So what are we going to do with all those people when the rest of the world legalize? So we have to be very, very careful what we're doing, you know, because People don't think about it, but it can also create a huge disaster around the equator, you know. So, regulation would be a better word than keep it maybe illegal in some countries that are really, really depending on it because they're very poor. And, you know, we changed our view a little bit, me and Franco, over the last 10 years working, you know. Because, of course, we were activists and fighting, you know, for the freedom of this plant. But if you come in Central Africa, and I am from Africa, I've lived there 12 years, you have to understand that the children cannot go to school because they have the garden kitchen. You know, and they have a vegetable field, they have a meat field, a corn field, they have a pot field. And if one of those fields get destroyed, yeah, they have they just die. End of story. It's, it's it's Africa, you know, it's it's a harsh condition. So and their marijuana is the most prestige thing, you know. We grow we give them seeds so they have a better turnout and they can get some medicine and they can get some fuel. That's the way. But we have to remind, you know, that in those countries when it will really get legal, it can be very difficult for a lot of people. And some countries, like half of the population, is dependent on it. It also has the potential, you know, a lot of the Caribbean countries are now talking about uh, legalization. And it can change, make, overnight it can make a poor nation into a travel destination, an exporter, Austin awesome Vincent is the biggest example. It's a great nation, you know, and the tourism is very low. There's only really high-end tourism in Ristika and, uh, and, and Beckway. That's where we hang out in a very, very rich villa because there's nothing else. But if you would really endorse uh, the local people to make like little cabins like in Thailand, for example, where, where in the 80s and the 90s, huge marijuana industry came and all the people went on the holidays, we myself went there 10, 20 times. It, it can create a lot of economic benefit to a country if they if they use it well. And maybe St. Vincent is going to do it. Well, Jamaica is doing it. Jamaica is taking it, you know, so... All right, I'd like to open up the floor to questions from the floor. So if anybody has a question for anybody here, feel free. These are not... They're, they're, uh, they're legal in some countries. They're tolerated in many countries. Uh, to say that they're completely legal would be a falsity. Even in Canada, you can buy seeds in a lot of stores, you can order seeds online. They're just not, they're very low priority. What is legal is, for, for the moment, is you're able to go and get a license to grow for yourself compassionately, or for a couple of friends, patients, what have you. There are compassion clubs. Those are, under, uh, those are operating in a gray zone, so they're not legal. What, what, they're, what the, they're changing the laws in Canada, and this is something to consider. They're, they're putting, uh, uh, they're making it impossible. You won't be able to grow your own. You won't be able to grow compassionately anymore. The, the requirements for setting up a commercial operation will just be astronomical. You need to have huge investment and backers. So the people who are currently growing, the, the current guns of people who are growing for themselves, who are growing compassionately, are, are going to be excluded. Who's going to come in into this new commercial pot business? It's people with money, people with connections with the government, and we all know there's corruption there. So, you know, that's, that's not really the solution. The solution to be, yeah, there's regulation, but there's a certain amount of deregulation as well. I mean, we have to find a way to grandfather the people who are already in this business so they're not left out in the future. I mean, because that's where all the knowledge is. And in Canada, there is a, an injunction that's just been filed uh, on behalf of class action suit on behalf of the patients uh, trying to protect their right to grow. Because the new, the, the new MMAR, as of March, it takes that away and, and concentrates it into commercial producers. And so far, everybody has to be ready for March. They have to supply what looks to be 100,000 patients, and there's only three that have been allotted. So, it's not going to work. So for, the, uh, for European situation, in, uh, in Holland it's not very good at the moment, but it's getting a little bit better. Uh, we had two right-wing governments after each other. 
and they came with all kinds of new rules, like um, the same one you have here in the States, 1,000 feet from dispensary. And there's some areas that are like uh, not allowed anymore to have any coffee shops. Um, they wanted to ban tourism, they did that partly in the south. And a few years ago we came with a new group of, uh, of, uh, of uh, owners together of the industry. And um, myself and a few other people, we came together and we said, okay, we're going to go really down now in the future. So we're going to have to find a way around. So we created a new group. And um, surprisingly, we, um, we subscribed George Soros, who's a big founder of, of many things and uh, in support of our industry. And also Richard Branson in, in England. And both of them have donated money to our organization to fight back. And since then, uh, it's going a little bit better. They're taking us a little bit more serious. They have stopped the, the, the ban on tourism in the north of Holland. But still, they're going to close another 80 coffee shops in Amsterdam in the next uh, one and a half year. So we're going to go back to, uh, from 20 years ago, 450 dispensaries, now 240. So it just gives you an idea, idea how difficult it is. And the situation in Spain is, is better. There, the last four years, roughly between, we don't exactly know the figures, but between 500 and 1,000 clubs have opened. And also there's growing going on the back door there. So there's more like growers behind them. If police find them, they cut them down. But until now, nobody's locked up in prison. And the judges are not really taking the court cases yet. It will happen soon. But um, uh, it's, it's looking better in Spain than in Holland. But overall, we are still open because of the American and Uruguay situation. So that's a little bit the situation we're in in Europe. My name is Larry Brook, and uh, I started a hydroponics company in the mid-70s. So for a long, long time, we've worked to try and build this technology for the benefit of the people. I'd like to thank you personally, RN, for your contributions of genetics. Because no matter how hard we try to grow a plant, it's always going to be limited by its genetics. And this brings me to the most important comment I can offer. A previous speaker indicated the risk that lies with legalization versus decriminalization. And the problem that I'm worried about is Monsanto and Philip Morris taking over our work and our business for their greedy, uh, for their stockholders. And the big concern I feel can be indicated by the past 20 years of medical cannabis research, which is to say physicians and scientists were compelled to use only varieties grown at the University of Mississippi by Dr. El Soli. This denied patients and scientists access to CBD strains and to a myriad of strains that you have developed brilliantly and superbly. So my concern is that we do not allow the giant corporations to take over our industry and once again bring harm to patients and to free individuals. Arian, thank you for your excellent work. Thank you very much, Larry. Yeah, well, we, we spoke about that before. Eh? Um, look, um, it's, it's very, very difficult, you know, especially when you have the situation here in America, in America where, where I'm a little bit scared because we work with lobby groups and everything is medical now, but we know all what's real medical, you know, and now it's going to go recreational. And once the big groups have smelled the money there and the taxes, where is it going to go, you know? Other lobbyists from the big companies are going to say, hey, listen guys, let's get rid of this whole medicinal thing and go completely recreational. And where do we go then, you know? This is one of the dangers. But for us breeders, I think the only thing we can do is just do a better job than the big Monsantos, you know? And uh, we just have to be better. We, we have 25 years of experience and we know we are probably one of the best growers in the world and we just have to make sure that we are better than them. Okay. Yes. And we are not so scared there because we know that there's people in the industry like yourself who bring on the battle and will have the horsepowers to race fast. So, thank you. Support organic farmers. I just want to say too that I don't believe the plants ever needed regulation. It just needs protection from regulation. And it's never going to go away because you guys are here. So that's the one thing that they can ever uh, do. If they make it too restrictive, the black market won't go away. They can't. They, they've got to be fair with this. And they've got, one day they'll realize it's just a plant. You can't regulate a plant. You can't legislate a plant. Because there's always going to be people like you here that are going to say, that are going to say so.
So, well, it will be in the hands of you guys here in America, that's for sure. You know, you are a great activist and you have been fight freedom fighters, all of you here in, in California and the rest of America. The only thing we can basically do, if the guys like Monsanto start dispensers, just burn them down, you know? <laughs> to North France, there was one organic farmer who burned down the McDonald's in his village, you know? So, you just have to make a point there, you know, the first one just have to burn down and just don't buy their goods, you know, and be organic. <laughs> Is there anyone else? Bigger TV networks, and it's a way to make sure that people that are not aware of the positive sides of cannabis become aware. As I always say, it's not about the, the cannabis people, it's about the non-cannabis people. Legalization, regulation and normalization can only happen when the majority of the population, which does not use cannabis, is not afraid, not scared and not alarmed by the minority that does use it. That is the situation, the social requirement for legalization, for regulation and for cannabis being considered a normal product. Cannabis will always be a minority product. There will never be the majority of the population of the planet using it. And probably it's right that, it's, that it is that way. But the majority cannot be scared of a minority, otherwise it never works. And that's what we try to do a little bit. We, we tried a very long time ago. We thought at that time the only way was to get big celebrities involved. So that's why we created the King of Cannabis like 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And everybody was laughing a little bit in the beginning. Hey, why are you doing this? Why are you, why are you taking it that route? Well, at that time nothing was existing in America. It was very legal here. And we were this very small niche market in Holland with a few coffee shops. And we had the idea at that time, let's get those big celebrities over, like Woody Harrison and Bill Maher and those kind of people, and go back to America and tell how good it is in Holland. And that was our approach, and that really worked in the end until last week you saw Miley Cyrus lighting up a joint at the MTV Awards, and making a statement. And if you, if you watch the whole MTV uh, Awards ceremony, you can see Ron Burgundy in a coffee shop, that's our coffee shop, yeah? <laughs> Lighting up a joint, talking about his friend Snoop Dogg, going away, and the lady you see Miley Cyrus lighting up a joint on the MTV Awards. MTV wants nothing to do with our industry because it's bad for their marketing. But they have set up the whole thing with me. You know, so, but you don't see the coffee shop directly, but you see the guy going inside, you see one of the guys wearing our greenhouse logo, the lady you see her lighting up a joint. They all technically want to be there, but they can't directly expose themselves because of their Christian background. That's, for example, the case with National Geographic and Discovery Channel. They're in the hands of the Christians, red states. So they are, they are like, you know, very skeptical of broadcasting our industry. It's very political. So the only way for us to get out there is have really, really good science people or, 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 or uh, recognized people or, you know, people like Sanjay Gujab and CNN or big celebrities like Richard Branson and George Soros stepping out there, stepping out there and helping us because us are not going to believe we're just a bunch of drug dealers and you guys are just a bunch of potheads yeah end of story so we need those really really high profile people to help us out and that's what's happening right now and that helped us a lot in the industry in the last five years that's the way to go you know use big celebrities to make your point and doctors and and and, and you see now with the cpds and, and little kids and that kind of stuff that helps us a lot we were also in the beginning when we were starting to make strainers, we said let's not go political, you know, let's just do our work and let's film the strange and let's not get too much involved in politics. But yeah, as we all know, I was 12 years spokesman for the Cannabis Retail Association in Holland. One, at one point you get there anyway, you know, so, and this was so obvious, you know, Trinidad and St. Vincent, two countries so close next to each other with such a different drug policy. That's so, so stupid, you know, that we said, okay, forget it. We've got a real show it now uh, on television, how one state is, is uh, co compared to the other state. And then just, you know, eight months or 12 months later, the president steps out and saw our documentary and just makes a statement on BBC documentary. Listen, I'm stopping with this bullshit. 
I, people can have an ounce now and can smoke a joint. Basically what he's saying, come to my country and, 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 and be a nice tourist and you can smoke pot, you know? So if we can add a little bit to the regulation of our plant and normalization, then we are really happy because that's one of the missions that we are trying to accomplish with trade hunters. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Thank People still do it and still grow it. That's how right. strong it is. Yeah, it's the plant. We are the stewards of the plant. They don't get it. They want to do like what they did to cocaine and heroin, which is still medicine if you go to those countries as a plant. They want to turn it into something that it isn't and then sell it back to us. But as long as we hold it and we're the stewards and good stewards, the plant is smarter than us. It's the vibe. It's coming up across the globe. The plant is raising the vibration of the, the whole, like Bob said, the more we burn the plant, the more Babylon falls. But I appreciate what you guys do, were doing, and are doing, and are going to continue to do, and I think it's with the seeds. And fuck it, if the corporation's taken over, we're still going to be here. We're practicing civil disobedience. We are not criminals. We're doing something that they are telling us is illegal, but what they're doing to us is criminal. And so, what you guys are doing, your soldiers, you know, right on, more power to you. Let's not wait till uh, big business comes with their regulations and uh, government come with the regulations. I think the key to this is that our industry be self-regulated so that we're, we're ready for the eventuality uh, where we'll have these rules imposed on us. If we're the more organized we are, the more we are self-regulated, the more we're working together, uh, the less uh, uh, the less opportunity Monsanto will come, have to come in and take over. And that wraps it up. I want to thank you guys once again, uh, and especially this panel for coming again from a really long way. Thanks for your fight here in the United States, you guys. Keep fighting. Huh? Yes, it's Green Avalanche now. Huh? Really special to be here. Thank you, California. Thanks a lot. Please use the link in the remarks above. Visit our website, sign up for newsletters, win a free grow light. Thank you. Bye.